Well, you guys can start making your way over to the book of Esther. We're continuing our study through that book. Humility, humility is one of the most difficult things for us as human beings to truly embrace and practice. Amen? We naturally look out for our own interests over the interests of others. We want the respect from others that we think we have coming to us. We may not demand the top spot, but we will fight tooth and nail to have the spot that we think we deserve. Humility is a character trait that the Bible has a lot to say about. It's one of the most oft, often taught on topics by Jesus himself. If you go through the Gospels and you were to collect and categorize all of the topics that he teaches about, humility is one of the top topics that he hits on again and again. Luke 14.11, for example, Jesus said on more than one occasion, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, the kingdom of God does not follow the self-centered, always looking out for yourself first rules of this world. Proverbs 18, 12. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Proverbs 29, 23. One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Proverbs 25, 6. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it's better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. And then finally, 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Humility and the lack of it will come up today several times in our Bible study and be a key element of this story. Well, just a quick review of where we're at and how we got to where we're at. The story of the book of Esther, it takes place in the capital city of Susa of the Persian Empire during the reign of King Xerxes around 480 B.C. Dur during this huge party that the king was hosting for his officials and other dignitaries of the empire, he ordered the queen to appear before him and his guests so he could show off how beautiful she was. But to his shock and embarrassment, she refused to come. And he was furious. So he asked his advisors what he should do, and they told him that they should have, him, have her stripped of her title as queen, and banished forever from his presence. Well, after he cooled down, he began to miss the queen. So he again asked his advisors what he should do. And they told him to conduct a search for a new queen among all of the most beautiful young virgins, virgins, not virgins, virgins, versions of virgins, <laughs> from all over the empire, and so it was done. The most beautiful young women from all over the empire were gathered into a special harem where they were put through a year-long preparation process. And then one by one, they would spend a night with the king. Well, one of the young women who had been taken and put into this special harem was a Jewish girl named Esther. See, after losing both of her parents when she was very young, her older cousin, Mordecai adopted her as his own daughter, and he's been raising her. Well, Esther's turn came to appear before the king, and she went to him, and his heart was immediately drawn to her. He loved her, it says, and he put the royal crown of the queen on her head. Well, why was the king drawn to Esther over all of the other young women? There were two reasons we talked about last time. First, because the king because of the Lord's hand that was on Esther, she was chosen. See, although she doesn't know it yet, she's going to play a key role in saving her people, the Jews, from annihilation. Esther becoming queen is part of the Lord's plan. Second, the king was drawn to Esther's inner beauty, her character. All of these young women were very beautiful physically. 
There, these were the most beautiful young women in the empire of Persia. But the thing that set Esther apart from all of the others was her character, her inner beauty. That's what captured King Xerxes' heart. 1 Peter 3, 4 says, Let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Well, let's flip over to Esther chapter 2, and we'll pick our story up in verse 19. Esther chapter 2, verse 19. It says, Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he took it to Queen Esther, And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. The author of the book of Esther gives us this bit of story which sets things up for the next big part of the story that will happen a little later on. There are four things that take place here that I want us to take note of. First is Mordecai, it says, is sitting at the king's gate. The men who sat at the king's gate, these were not a bunch of lazy punk thugs loitering around intimidating the people passing by. That's not what these men were. That's what it often is in our own day, but it wasn't that way in their day. Instead, these were respected older men of the city who were given responsibility to settle disputes between people, to give advice and counsel to folks. Mordecai, in all probability, was already serving in this position before Esther became queen. This job had not been acquired through cronyism or nepotism after Esther became queen. Mordecai had been chosen for this job by his peers because of the great respect that he had earned among them over the years. He was known for his wise counsel and his uncompromising character. Second, Esther has continued to keep her Jewish background a secret, like Mordecai had told her to do, even after becoming queen. The king and the others in the court still don't know that she is a Jew or that she and Mordecai are related to each other. This will become a key element in the plot of the story as we get further into it. Third, Esther continued to obey Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him, it tells us in verse 20. So even now, as queen, Esther continues to respect her adoptive father, Mordecai. And in this, we see the character of Esther again revealed. She obeys the Lord's command, the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy 5.16 says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long. She has remained humble. Many people of lesser character would have let the position of queen go to their head. But Esther hasn't let that happen. This is no small thing. Great success and position can be a very corrupting influence in a person's life. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, Pride grows in the human heart like lard on a pig. I like that sentence. We're going to meet one of these prideful pigs when we get to chapter 3 of our story today. Fourth, we're told about an incident that took place at the king's gate. Mordecai, while he's serving there at the gate, he learns of a plan by these two guys, Bigthan and Teresh. And that sounds like a couple of gangsters, doesn't it? They were plotting to assassinate the king. 
Mordecai finds out about it. He passes the information on to Esther, who then passed the information on to the king, giving Mordecai credit for it. Well, normally, a person would be immediately rewarded by the king for doing what Mordecai has done. I mean, he saved the king's life, which in that culture and time was considered as good of a deed as you could do. But for some inexplicable reason, the king forgets to reward Mordecai for his good deed. Well, there really is a reason for the king's forgetfulness. The Lord is at work, setting things up for the fulfillment of his plan. One day in the future, Mordecai is going to be rewarded for this good deed, and it will come at a crucial time when Mordecai and God's people will get maximum benefit from it. We'll have to wait until we get a little further in the story to learn how that plays out. You see, there's all of these things to look forward to. Well, as a point of application in how Mordecai behaves here, I'd like to point out that we, too, need to come to a place in our life where we trust the Lord with everything that's taking place, even the bad stuff. See, Mordecai, he could have gotten upset about the fact that he has, been, has not been rewarded for this good deed that he's done. He could have started complaining about how he's been passed over and overlooked and neglected and taken advantage of here. He could have started whining to Esther about how the king is treating him unfairly and then ask her to talk to the king on his behalf to somehow get rewarded for his good deed. But he doesn't do any of that. Instead, he just trusts the Lord. He trusts the Lord that he will take care of everything in his time. When things are not going the way we want them to go, rather than getting upset and behaving badly and claiming our turf, we need to trust the Lord and remember that He's in control of everything. We ruin so many of our life experiences and miss out on things that the Lord wants to teach us because of our bad attitude, our lack of patience, and our failure to trust Him, don't we? Verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, After these things that we've just talked about and read about, King Xerxes promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So we finally meet now the villain of our story. This is that prideful pig that I mentioned a moment ago, Haman. Sometime after these other events, this assassination attempt that Mordecai uncovered and then passed on to the king, King Xerxes honors a man named Haman, elevating him to a position of authority over all of the other nobles. He is now vice king of the empire. Why this man, Haman, is honored like this by the king, we're not told. But as we get further into the story, we will see that Haman is a weasel. He has probably worked his way into this position through deception, lying, and manipulation. And as we have already observed over and over again, King Xerxes is not the brightest person we've ever encountered. So it's not difficult for us to see, really, how a person like Haman could trick and manipulate the king into giving him a position like this. The king commanded all of the other officials and workers to kneel down and be before Haman and pay him honor, but Mordecai refused to do it. 
he wouldn't kneel down or honor Haman. The other workers at the king's gate, they appealed to Mordecai day after day, urging him to obey the king's command to honor Haman. But Mordecai, he says, no. He's not going to do it because he's a Jew. Well, this is interesting because Mordecai had commanded Esther to keep it a secret that she's a Jew. But now he himself, he makes his Jewishness the central reason for why he's not going to bow down to Haman. Now, being a Jew didn't prohibit you from bowing down and showing respect to an authority as long as the authority is not claiming to be a god and the bowing down is not understood to be a gesture of worship. So there's something else going on here causing Mordecai to consider it a violation of his conscience to honor Haman. Haman is an Agagite. You go, oh, that's why. The Agagites were long-standing enemies of the Jews. It's believed that Haman is a direct descendant of the cruel Amalekite king Agag that's mentioned in 1 Samuel 15. You might remember the prophet Samuel had ordered the first king, King Saul, to kill Agag. And he let him live. Samuel finished the job, though. You you might remember he cut him into pieces. But he had already had descendants, apparently. And Haman is believed to have been one of his descendants. In Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 16, it tells the story of when the Amalekites ruthlessly attacked the Jewish people as they were making their way across the desert after escaping Egyptian slavery. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17, the Lord said to the Israelite people through Moses, remember what Amalek, the Amalekites, Agag was an Amalekite, Haman is an Amalekite, an Agagite, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt. How he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail. Those who were lagging behind you and he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the, the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Now, we don't fully understand the reason for this deep rift between the Israelites and the Amalekites, but it was obviously huge and very important. And Mordecai is one of the people who have not forgotten what the Amalekites have done to his people. Mordecai knows the kind of person Haman really is and refuses to honor him. See, this is not simply some kind of grudge that Mordecai has against these people. We'll see in a moment how right Mordecai is in his assessment of Haman. He is evil. The other workers, they tell Haman about Mordecai's refusal to honor him to see if Mordecai's behavior will be tolerated or not. So in verse 5, it says, And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes, or all of the Persian Empire. So when Haman sees that Mordecai refuses to kneel down or give him honor, he's filled with fury, it says. And the Hebrew word is translated into English there. It can also be translated as poison or venom, depending on the context. And it, it provides an image for us of how angry and vengeful Haman is. He is filled with poison or venom toward Mordecai and his people. He's so mad and vengeful that he not only wants to kill Mordecai, 
But every Jew in the kingdom, he wants to exterminate the entire Jewish race. We now begin to see the true colors of this man, Haman, and we can understand why Mordecai has refused to show him any respect. He deserves no respect. He is an evil man. It is outrageous that a person would want to take another person's life for something as trivial as refusing to bow to him to show him respect. But to be so full of hatred and poison that you want to not only kill him, but wipe out his entire race is beyond comprehension. Haman is a very disturbed individual or perhaps demon-possessed. Can you think of anyone else in history who wanted to wipe out the entire Jewish race, blaming them for everything wrong in his world? That's right, Hitler. In fact, the Jews likened Hitler to Haman during World War II for obvious reasons, and they found great comfort and encouragement in the book of Esther as they faced this unbelievable suffering inflicted upon them by the Nazis and Haman or Hitler. Verse 7, it says, In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Xerxes, they cast per, that is, they cast lots, before Haman, day after day, and they cast it month after month until the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. So in the twelfth year of Xerxes' reign, Queen Esther has been queen for about five years now. In the twelfth year of Xerxes' reign is when this takes place, and in the first month of the year, Haman had the purr, or lots, cast to select his lucky day for having the Jews slaughtered. That's what they're describing here. See, in many cultures at that time, lots were cast, or a similar type thing, for determining the will of the gods for various things. Casting lots was was done a number of different ways. Some used a special set of stones with markings or colors on them similar to dice. And they would cast these or throw them down and then based on what markings came up, they would then interpret that meaning and the will of the gods. I mean, we've seen, uh, you know, witch doctors throw the bones down, you know, from some dead chicken that they've been hanging on to for years. And the way the bones land on the ground you know, they interpret that to mean something that the gods are telling. It's the same kind of idea. So Haman, he rolls his lucky dice to choose a day for killing the Jews. And his lucky day is the 13th day of the 12th month of the year. Verse 8. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business that they may put it into the king's treasuries. <clears throat> so now that Haman has chosen his lucky day, it's time for him to go to the king to get his royal approval so that he can put his diabolical plan into action. And Haman, he's very sly in the way that he does this in gaining the king's approval for his plan to wipe out the Jews. He never mentions the Jews by name here, does he? He says, it's a certain people. Instead, he describes them as a certain people dispersed throughout the kingdom who have different cultures from all the other peoples, that they don't obey the king's laws, they have their own laws. Haman counsels the king that it's not in the king's best interest or in the best interest of the empire to let these people survive. He never mentions that his own wounded ego is what is really at stake here. Haman offers a plan for protecting the kingdom from this destructive influence. He recommends a decree be issued throughout the empire to have these people exterminated. 
He offers to put up 10,000 talents of silver into the royal treasury as bounty money for the men who carry out the killings. Now, Haman is a wealthy person, but this is an astronomical amount of money that he is offering here. It's believed that he was probably planning to plunder the property of the Jews and use that money as bounty money. Verse 10, So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you and the people also to do with them as it seems good to you. So in typical fashion, King Xerxes tells Haman to keep his money gives him the king's royal signet ring and tells him to go ahead and do with this people as he thinks best. In other words, don't bother me with the details, Haman. I trust you. Go ahead and just take care of this problem for us. By giving Haman his royal signet ring, the king is giving Haman unlimited authority to do whatever he wants because that ring was used to seal documents to make them official. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month and and an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly, by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into, into confusion. So, Haman had the royal secretaries write up orders for exterminating the Jews, every child in the empire. In the name of King Xerxes, he has a seal with the king's signet ring, making the order official and irrevocable. And then, the creepiest thing of all is the king and Haman sit down and have a drink together, congratulating each other for a job well done. But the city of Susa, it says, was thrown into confusion. They are bewildered and deeply disturbed. A dark cloud is hovering over the city. The people aren't sure what this all means and how they should respond to it. It is a shocking turn of events. It's frightening to see how much authority has been given to this madman. Little does the king know that he has just signed the death warrant for his own queen and all of her people. Chapter 4, verse 1, it says, When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, There was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Well, at this point in the story, it looks like humility and the kingdom of God have lost the battle. But it's not over yet. There's more to the story to be told. And this in itself is a life lesson for us. We need to wait until the end of the story of our life too. So you may be in the middle of a 
really bad chapter in your life right now, and it looks hopeless with no way out. But I want to remind you that the story isn't over yet for you. With the Lord, there is always hope. And just like there is another chapter in the story of Esther and Mordecai, there is another chapter for you too. Remember Romans 8.28? We've been looking at that passage as part of our study here. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. There's another chapter. We're going to leave the story right here this morning, kind of a cliffhanger. (laughs) But in closing, I want to reflect quickly on Mordecai's character in closing. He's a man of strong convictions and an unbending will. It can be really hard sometimes to do the right thing and stick to it. Sometimes it can come at great cost to us to do the right thing. We'll be faced with questions of doubt, wondering if we have done the right thing or not, whether we have taken our principles too far or not. Mordecai, I mean, can you imagine what he must be wrestling with right now? Feelings and thoughts of this kind. Feeling responsible for this nightmare that's enveloped him and all of the Jewish people throughout the empire. But he sticks to his principles. He remains immovable in his convictions here. He refuses to compromise And God is going to reward him for his courage. We cannot compromise with evil. You can't. It doesn't bargain. It will stab you in the back every time. If you capitulate, you will gain nothing. You will only lose your honor and dignity and you will still see evil have its way. It cheats. Always. It never plays fair. We must fight evil. There is no other choice. When we give in to temptation and sin in our life, for example, we have not bought peace with it. It will not be satisfied. It will want more and more. See, there's that lie and that hope that we tell ourselves that, you know, if I, if I just give in this time, then the desire, it it will be satisfied, it will go away, and, and everything will be fine then. That's a lie. We're just feeding it and making it stronger when we give in. It will not be satisfied. And it will be harder to stand up against it the next time. We can't make a deal with the devil in whatever form he takes. There's only one right thing to do when we're faced with evil. Fight it. Refuse to compromise. Refuse to bend to it. Things look really bad right now for Mordecai and the Jewish people. But as unbelievable as it may be for you to believe this, his attitude is, it is better to die with honor doing the right thing than to live as a sellout and be killed in the end anyway. He would rather do the right thing, die with honor, than live as a sellout. First Peter 5, 6, we read this at the beginning. I want to leave us with this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, 
casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. This is what Mordecai is doing. And God will exalt him and lift him up because he cares for him. Cast your anxieties on God because he cares for you too. He loves you. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this story of Esther and these powerful examples that we have in people like Esther and Mordecai, people of courage and principle. people of great faith who trust in you and hang on to you. I ask you to encourage your people this morning and, and give us strength, Father. Give us courage. Encourage us. Remind us of your great love for us, Lord, that you care for us. That whatever the, the chapter looks like that we're living in right now, it's not the last chapter. We trust you. You know what you're doing. And you bring good out of everything. Thank you for your great love, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.